Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Thank you very much for maintaining the spirit, ladies and gentlemen. Let us continue talking about nurturing the young generation. Before I invite the next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, just a little bit of sharing. I am so proud of my daughter where she's able to achieve eight A's in her UPKK. It's a kind of Islamic examination for those studying in primary five. And I'm proud of my daughter. She's able to achieve Mumtaz in her examination as well when she is in her uh, primary six. But one thing that I didn't expect is that other than learning this Arabic language, so on and so forth, learning about Usuluddin, learning about Sirah, learning about um, Fiqh and everything else, I didn't expect her to be able to speak in Korea. She can speak Korean, ladies and gentlemen. And one of the main reasons is that it's because of this K-pop culture. What I'm telling you that the challenge nowadays, whether we like or not, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot deny this K-pop culture is coming in our community. Therefore, it is very important for us to instill this Tawheed to our children so that they have the filter in whatever they receive, inshallah, they receive only the goods and they will try to avoid those bad or evil uh, elements in this K-pop culture and anything else. So it is very important, ladies and gentlemen, to make sure that Tawheed can be, uh, inshallah, either obviously or maybe indirectly instilled in, our, in, in, in the young generation education. So ladies and gentlemen, before that, can I just make a little bit random uh, survey? And one of you who are 20 years below, can you raise up your hand? 20 years below, Masha Allah, ke ada yang tak sedar di umur berapa? Okay, tak sedar tak apa, jangan tak sedar lagi. Tak sedar diri, tuan-tuan. Alright, Alhamdulillah. So, let us continue our session, tuan-tuan, ladies and gentlemen. The importance of Tawheed in education for new Muslims. Our speaker, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, is from United Kingdom. Bukan ulu kelang, tuan-tuan. His education, Alhamdulillah, diploma in Arabic language from Islamic University of Medina, Saudi Arabia. Bachelor in Sharia for Islamic from Islamic University of Medina, Saudi Arabia. Master in Islamic Law from SOS, University of London. And Certification in Islamic uh, Chaplaincy from College of the Prophet's Masjid, Medina, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. And ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to invite on stage Sheikh Wasim Kemson. Dipersilakan, tafadalu, mashkura. I could be asked, what did you do different? Or did you say something? That, what was the formula? What was the formula? And <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, honestly, that, that there is no, nothing. It's just, it's just from Allah. Yeah. Subhanahu wa taala. It's if Allah subhanahu wa taala decrees to guide a person, it will be at that time. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Indeed all praise and thanks is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah alone and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is his final messenger My dear brothers and sisters Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh It is indeed, mashallah, a very great honor and a blessing for me to be here with you to speak about the greatest of topics in Al-Islam. And that is the kalimah of La ilaha illallah. That by it, a person will earn their salvation and be saved from any punishment in the hereafter. So to be here in your presence with you to speak about these great topics, to be part of such a blessed conference. I can only thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that, that I'm given this opportunity maybe just to share a few words with you. And we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to benefit 
from the time that we have with one another. So the topic that was given to me, I think I have some experience in that. And when I say I have some experience, in that I have gone through these stages. Because what we want to talk about is the importance, the importance of a tawheed for the new Muslim. Now there was once upon a time I was considered a new Muslim and mashallah there are many perks and benefits of being a new Muslim in gatherings that you know you never have to pay for any food. You always get put to the front. So being the new Muslim was always a blessing within itself from that per perspective. However, the years have passed by and uh, a few gray hairs have appeared and they now know that no, no, no longer am I a new Muslim. So I don't get those blessings. Well, I don't get that preferential treatment because Alhamdulillah, there are so many other people embracing Islam, new Muslims, and we want to treat them in the very best way, which is what they deserve. So I guess I went through this stage about the importance of knowing At-Tawheed. Now, I'm sure that you have listened to many a lecture, not only today, listening to the importance of At-Tawheed, the oneness and uniqueness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we don't want this to be, if you like, a theoretical knowledge. We don't want this to be something that, a knowledge that remains in the books. We don't want this to be a knowledge that when you are asked about the categories of a tawheed, you can mention them. First category, second category, third category, or whether you want to do a different categorization. But it doesn't impact your heart. It doesn't raise your iman. We don't want this. Because if we think about the purpose why we are here, that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. This is why Allah Jalla wa Ala, why He created us. And also that the Prophets, alayhim salatu salam, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, that they were sent for the purposes of what? To teach you and I to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and to stay away from false deities. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you, wants us as Muslims, to completely submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not just a knowledge, but it's an action. It is an action that you will live. You want to live and experience the kalima of la ilaha illallah. If I give you an example, there was a companion who was Uthman ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, Uthman. And he become old in his age. And so he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I want to make a place. I want to make a place in my home for salah, for prayer. And I want you to come and designate that place for me. Maybe he wasn't able to, he wasn't able to go to the masjid all the time. So the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he agrees and goes to the house of Utbani ibn Malik. And so when this happens, the following day, the Sahaba, they see the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam enter the house. Everybody surrounds the house. It's like a, a big event. And so as they are looking around and they are seeing the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the house of Utban, then somebody says, Aynu Fulan. Because they can see everybody here except so and so. So where is so-and-so? Where is he? And then somebody shouts out, he's a munafiq. He's a hypocrite. How could you not be here? And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he hears this. He hears this. He says, don't say that. La taqul thalik. Do you not know that that person you are speaking to, that he says, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah Khalisun Min Qalbihi that he says this kalima and not just does he say it he says it sincerely from his heart which is an added level which is something that maybe 
we need to aspire to, to we need to achieve. So this kalima of la ilaha illallah is not something that you just, I know it. No. Yes, of course. فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ That you need to know la ilaha illa Allah. And as I mentioned this verse actually, something comes to my mind. فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Does anybody know which surah this is? Surah Luqman? Surah Muhammad, yes, Ahsant. It is in Surah Muhammad. Now, Surah Muhammad is a Madani Surah. It's a Madani Surah. Meaning that it was revealed after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had gone to Medina. Thirteen years had passed in Mecca. And then these chapters, they were revealed. And if you think that this verse itself is directed first and foremost because it's a command to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. فَعَلَمْ That you need to know. And subhanAllah, even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was commanded by Allah Jalla wa Ala to have knowledge of. And he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam no doubt had the greatest knowledge of La ilaha illallah. But if you think about this verse itself alone, who it was direct to, when it was directed to, it shows us the importance of what? Knowledge. Knowledge of this kalima. But it doesn't stop there. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكْ And then seek forgiveness for your sins, which is your actions. So as Muslims, we go through our lives attaining, con well, we go to conferences, attaining knowledge. We go to classes, we learn Arabic, and we bring about all this knowledge, this bring it, mashaAllah. But what is next after that? is to act upon that knowledge. You must act upon it. You cannot be from those people who acquire this knowledge and then simply don't act upon it. You make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal every day. Whether you realize this or not. You make dua to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala 17 times a day not to be from those type of people where you have knowledge and that you don't act upon it. But then you may say, wait a minute, I know, I know all the supplications, I know all the du'as that I make. You know, oh Allah, grant me tawfiq, grant me success, grant me guidance, you know, a pious spouse, pious husband, pious wife, good house, good children. I know the things I'm making du'a for. But when am I asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give me knowledge and to act upon it? And not to be from those who don't act upon it. At the end of Surah Al-Fatiha, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ And then you say, Ameen. So, when you say, Ameen, you know that you've made dua, right? What did you make dua for? So, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide me to the, or guide us to the straight path. And then after that, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ not those whom have earned your anger. Those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry with. And who are those? Those are people who have knowledge. They know. But they do not act upon it. So this topic of a tawheed, the title of the conference here about the importance of a tawheed, is the very essence, the very center of everything that a Muslim is going to start with, with regards to their belief. Absolutely everything. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why five times you pray? Why do you not do this? You don't eat this, you don't drink that, you dress in a particular way. Why, 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 why? Everything quite simply directs and goes back to Understanding of La ilaha illallah. Because this is what identifies you as a Muslim. One who submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now moving on. Because I've mentioned, for no doubt you have heard, similar to that what I've mentioned today. And you will hear something similar to that tomorrow. But what has this got to do with the new Muslims? Do we have anything 
Do we have anything from the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that teaches us, that can guide us about the importance of dealing with La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah for a new Muslim? Shouldn't it be the same for any Muslim? Yes, it should. It should, of course. But there are no doubt different approaches and different ways with regards to different people. Not all people are the same. So the Prophet ﷺ went to great levels, worked very hard to ensure that the message of La ilaha illallah was delivered to the people. On the day of Arafah, when the Prophet ﷺ is performing the only hajj of his life, and he's addressing the companions and almost indirectly addressing mankind, Ya ayyuhan nas, O people the famous sermon that was delivered on the day of Arafah. At the end, the, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Have I not conveyed the message to you? Do you not understand what has been said to you? Is everything clear to you? This is what the Prophet ﷺ said to the more than 100,000 of the Sahaba performing Hajj at that particular time. And whoever is not here, let that person convey to the one who is not here. From the very beginning, when the Prophet ﷺ is in the cave of Al-Hira, then the angel Jibreel ﷺ, السلام, he comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Iqara, bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. The first revelation comes to an Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Five verses from Surah Al-Alaq. At this point here, the Prophet ﷺ becomes a Nabi, becomes a Prophet. And then a while later, the Prophet ﷺ receives more revelation. Ya ayyuhal muddathir, qum fa'anthir. Oh, the one who is wrapped up in garments, stand up and warn the people. Here now the Prophet ﷺ, after calling his immediate family, the first believer, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Here the Prophet ﷺ was then commanded to speak to everybody else. To warn them about a punishment of Allah ta'ala. And as we know, the Prophet ﷺ was not only a nadir, a warner, but was also a mubashir. One who gives glad tidings. But to start with, you need to be aware that there is a punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is also in line with when the Prophet والسلام, is standing on the mountain. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ And warn your closest relatives that the Prophet والسلام, stands on the mountain. He calls his people. He calls his tribes. They're all standing there below him. And he establishes himself with them. If I was to warn you about an army behind this mountain coming to attack you, would you believe me? And they would say nothing else but, you are Sadiqul Amin. You're the truthful one, the trustworthy one. And so here the Prophet Sallallahu warns them about the punishment of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And then of course, the disbelievers at that time rebuked. Why have you brought us here for this. This is a joke. What is that? And here the enmity started between the Prophet ﷺ, or rather from their side towards the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to warn his people about the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now why am I mention this and what's it got to do with you Muslims? When speaking with new Muslims, where the seed of faith, the seed of Iman, it has entered their hearts, it will take time to grow. It will take time to grow. Just as any one of us, we go to the gym, for the example before, I'm sure, one wants to start to, to be a runner. You can't just decide, right, tomorrow I'm going to run a marathon. You won't be able to be walking if you can even make it. Or you can't just walk into the gym and pick up like 150 or 100 kgs and stuff. You can't do that. You need to build yourself up. 
Similarly with Al-Islam, that new Muslim needs to build themselves up. And there is great guidance in how we should what? How we should deal with each of these individuals, step by step. But the Prophet ﷺ, in his example, went to great lengths. You cannot believe, you cannot imagine how haris, and what do I mean by haris? How the Prophet ﷺ was like a guard over his believers, a protector over his believers. That he was very much involved and engaged with every single one of the Sahaba. If somebody was missing, he والسلام, would know who's missing, even though that there may be hundreds of people. Imagine that. There's thousands of people. And an example is that the Prophet والسلام, is going to Tabuk. And the Muslims, they leave in the thousands to go and meet the Romans. And so the Prophet ﷺ is looking around and he says, Where is Ka'b ibn Malik? Where is Ka'b? And the story continues. Point being what? That the Prophet ﷺ was aware of who was present and who wasn't present. He was so loving and protective over the Sahaba. Yes, radiallahu anhum. But he sallallahu alayhi wa was also protective and had a love for people Muslims that he never met. And he would even be very open with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. He says that I would love to meet my brothers. He said, the Sahaba, Alasna ikhwanak. Are we not your brothers, O Messenger of Allah? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, You are my companions. These people are those who believe in me and have never seen me. That the Prophet ﷺ had this eagerness in wanting to meet, and we can be quite clear now, that he wanted to meet every single one of you. Now, to put that into perspective, that maybe you're in a special place, you're in a university, and you know there's a gift to be given out. Is meeting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa being in his person, would that be a great and beautiful gift? Yes, absolutely. You're in university, there's a gift going to be come out, given out, and your name is called. And you are so happy. So and so, I'm going to meet so and so, and I'm going to get my gift. The Prophet alayhi wants to meet every single one of you. By name, individually. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa went to great lengths to protect his ummah, to protect all Muslims, from anything that would harm them. And that he was towards the believers, humble, merciful to them. The Prophet ﷺ calling his people for years. Every opportunity to call them to Islam, he would do that. ﷺ. What he would begin with? La ilaha illallah. Even if a person has an issue, and in the modern day now, people have a number of issues with Islam. Islam says this, Islam says that, why you can't do this, why you can't do that, why do you have to do this, why do you have to do that? If you start dealing with these, if you want to say, peripheral issues, issues that are on the outside, and don't attach them to the middle, then the person may never understand the reality of why. Why is it like this? The dress code the food rulings, or other issues, inheritance rules, things which you know, people usually bring out as, as problems in Islam, because they don't understand. But to bring it back to the core of la ilaha illallah means you understand and submit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows best for, with regards to our interests. 13 years the Prophet ﷺ calling his people. In the 10th year, his uncle, Abu Talib, his uncle, Abu Talib, who, let's be honest, he did a lot for the Prophet He made sure that the other tribes would not harm his nephew. He looked after the Prophet for more than 40 years. The closest to that what you would find as a father figure in the life of Rasulullah So he becomes very ill 
and he's like he's on his deathbed. So the Prophet والسلام, wants him to enter into Al Islam. Because entering into Islam means that you will find your salvation. So the first thing that the Prophet says, Ya Am, O Uncle, قل لا إله إلا الله. Say the word, say the kalima of La ilaha illa Allah. Ashfa' laka biha yawm al qiyama. I'll intercede for you. I'll speak for you on your behalf on the day of judgment. It may be that you, because you are on your deathbed, you didn't do lots of actions. You didn't pray a lot. You didn't do all these things. But this is something that you can attain salvation. You can be free from the hellfire. But as we know, Abu Talib, he did not say the kalima. And so he did not attain salvation. And this saddened the Prophet ﷺ greatly. And he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to lighten the punishment for his uncle. But what is the point of mentioning the story? Well, there are many points. The one I want to focus on is that the Prophet ﷺ focused on saying the word of La ilaha illallah for that person to enter into Al-Islam. And that is the focus. That was in the 10th year after the Prophet ﷺ had received revelation. I want to now jump and fast forward to the 10th year after Hijrah. So maybe another 13 years later. The Prophet ﷺ, he chooses a Sahabi. He speaks to a companion. This companion, his name is Mu'adh ibn Jabal. Mu'adh ibn Jabal. So the Prophet ﷺ has become old in his age, 62 years old. He says, Ya Mu'adh, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa like you cannot imagine. And for them to be spoken to on a one-on-one -on -one situation was ni'mah, was a blessing. So the Prophet ﷺ, he, he pulls Mu'adh aside. He says, Ya Mu'adh, I have a job and a, a responsibility for you to carry out. So Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, he gets onto his, his ride, camel. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he takes the reins of the ride and starts to walk with Mu'adh. So Mu'adh, try to imagine this. Mu'adh radiallahu anhu is on his, his, let's say, his camel. And the Prophet ﷺ is pulling the camel along with Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And here between them, there is a conversation which is for us represents guidance and methodology how to give da'wah. How to give da'wah. You know, there are sometimes workshops, there are sometimes courses, lectures, how to give da'wah. All very important. No lecture, no talk, no workshop, no course, no book is worth anything or it's not 100% unless this incident is mentioned. This incident has to be mentioned. Why? Because it represents a starting point, how to give da'wah. So imagine now, let's say I choose, because with Mu'adh ibn Jabal, another companion was sent. His name was Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, radiallahu anhu. The Prophet Alaihissalam chooses these two companions. And he says to them both, I'm going to send you to another land. It's like me choosing, or somebody who's in charge, he knows you well. He says, you know, you and you, I'm going to send you to another country. Another country. There's no Islam in that country. No Islam. You too have the responsibility of teaching those people Al-Islam. Can you imagine what responsibility would be on your shoulders? Me? I have to take Islam to another country. I'm going to go there to these people who don't know Islam. Two people. And as we know now, in the year 2024 now, that country now is full of Muslims. 
Islam spread everywhere. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is speaking to Mu'adh. He says, Oh Mu'adh, I have to be honest with you that maybe when you return, when you come back, I won't be here. This is like a shock to the system of Mu'adh ibn Jabal. To have a life without the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. The Prophet has given me a job, a responsibility. I'm going to go and do it the best I can. And when I come back, no doubt, I want to tell you, inform you, whether it was successful or not. The Prophet says, no. When you come back, I may not be here. This will be my masjid and this will be my grave. So this hurt, or rather he was very, very sad upon hearing this. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, إِنَّكَ تَأْتِي قَوْمًا You are going to a people, أهل الكتاب. You're going to the people of the book in Al-Yaman. فَلْيَكُنْ أَوَّلْ مَا تَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَيْهِ The first thing that you're going to teach them is what? أَن تَشْهَدُوا إِلَّا يَشْهَدُوا إِلَّا 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 That they will make the testification and يَشْهَدُوا إِلَّا 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 وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ They make the testification or testimony of faith. They enter into Al-Islam. That is the thing, the first thing. That is the first thing that you're going to teach them. فَإِنْهُمْ أَطَاعُوا لِذَلِكَ If they obey you in this, they accept. There is only one worthy of worship except Allah alone. And they accept Muhammad وسلم, as the messenger of Allah. Now they are new Muslims. They're new Muslims. You return? No. The job is not done. The job is not done. Because the new Muslim, they need to be looked after. They need to be looked after. They have may, maybe had a life of 20, 30, 40 years of other than Islam. They need somebody to be there with them. A lot of the time we are focused on, you have an organization maybe. Or you have a job. How many Muslims became, how many people became Muslims with you this year? How many? Your organization. How many Muslims you have? So you go to your statistics and you say, this is organization number one. They say, we have 36. 36. They say 36. In one year, 36 people. What does that work out to be? Like one every 10 days? Is that it? can't believe. Organization, organization number two now. Do you know how many they have? They have 2,500. They have 2,500 people became Muslim. And you have 36. What is going on? They said, no, no, no. But the 36 who became Muslim with us this year, 36 of them attend the masjid every single day. 36 of them are still with us. And they attend all of our courses. So those who embraced Islam, 36, 36, they stayed with us. They said, oh, that's interesting. Let us ask organization number two. So you had 2,000 people who became Muslim with you. Uh, how many people attend your courses? So they go, yeah, well, on so-and-so, we had eight. We had eight attend. On another day, we had 12. That was a good day. We had 12. 12. Another day, yeah, we had 10. Then we had seven. And they go through their courses. And then they see that the attendance, well, what happened to the 2,500? Well, Allah, they became Muslim, alhamdulillah. But where are they? No, they've gone out and they're, they're doing their jobs. And are they? What did you teach them? We taught them, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. This is our job. The rest is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, who will teach them salah? Who will teach them the fara'id of al-Islam? Who will teach them the Islamic manners and the Islamic adab and the mu'amalat, how we deal with one another? Who will teach them? You will give them books? Ma'asalama? Is this how it works? It's about numbers? The Prophet ﷺ says to Mu'adh, when they embrace Islam, they accept la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. What do you do? You come back? No. You stay there. 
then you teach them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated khamsu salawatin fi kulli yawmin wa layla. There are five prayers that you need to establish every day and night. And for every Muslim, new, old, whatever, understanding la ilaha illallah is the center and the start, as I mentioned. But your salah, your prayer, is your daily connection with your Rabb. It's your daily connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is your daily sustenance. When you wake up in the morning, you have your breakfast maybe. At midday, you have your lunch. In the, more, in the afternoon, you may have some more food and drink. You want to keep your body alive. Your salah, your prayer, is the sustenance for your soul. For you to have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the single most or the biggest problem that people have when they say, my iman is weak. My iman is weak. I feel like I'm getting far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially with new Muslims. And to be honest, with Muslims in general. And they said, you know, I don't feel Allah is answering my dua. My blessings are less. I'm, I'm having a hard life. They're complaining. So you go and you speak to them. And you say, okay, so tell me about it more. And then you say, if you ask the question, how is your salah? Now for a lot of us, that's a personal question. Don't ask me. It's my private. It's private. Don't ask me about that. But if you want to be open in your nasiha, in your advice, how is your salah? A very, very high percentage. They say, yeah, I don't pray like I used to. I'm not praying like I used to. Right there. Right there is the mushkila. Because if you want to have the knowledge of la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, as I mentioned, the knowledge of it, what's the first action for you to live it now? is your salah. If you are offering your salah, you are actively, actively living la ilaha illallah. How many times a day you're placing your face on the floor in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a reminder of who you are. You submit, you bow down, you prostrate only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So your prayer. And this is what, this is what Mu'adh radiallahu anhu was taught by the Prophet sallallahu to teach the people. Stop there? No, it doesn't stop there. فَإِمْ أَطَاعُوكَ If they uh, obey you and follow you in this, then teach them, teach them, فَعَلِمْهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ افْتَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَدَقَةً That there is a, a charity that has to be paid from their money. The rich people, they have to pay money as a charity. Does this money, it comes back to Al-Medina? comes back to the Muslims in Al-Medina? No. Very important points. That the Prophet Sallallahu said, this money, تُؤْخَذُ مِنْ أَغْنِيَائِهِمْ is taken from their rich in that area. فَتُرَدُّ فِي فُقْرَائِهِمْ And it's returned to their poor. From their rich to their poor. It will remain with them. Can you imagine? They were new Muslims. They newly embraced Islam. They believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. They establish their salah. And then they say, we need your money. You need to give your money for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they go away and they say, hey, where's our money gone? They want to know and understand that this is not the point. It's not about money. But it is about a community, about a people who help one another. You support one another. You live in the same land, the same city, the same village. Everybody's there to help one another. And then the Prophet sallallahu said, and this is of course more detail to Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, إِيَّاكُمْ إِيَّاكُمْ وَكَرَأَمَ الْأَمْوَالِ That you take from their best wealth. Because maybe their, their wealth is not necessarily, maybe gold and silver, maybe the Zakah is paid in camels, and sheep, and cows. Don't take from the best that they have. Take from the middle. You know, don't take a sheep who's got three legs. Nobody wants a sheep with three legs, right? Or a, a cow with two legs. No, we don't want the, the, uh, the sadaqah, which is not of value to anyone. 
Or you take the very best cow or that gives the most milk. Don't do that. Take the one that's in the middle and then you give that to the poor. Subhanallah. So the Prophet ﷺ gives us a blueprint, a template to follow. These are new Muslims. The thing that you're going to focus on, Kalimatu la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Then establish the prayer in their lives. And with regards to their sadaqah, with regards to their mal. And if you think about it, how wise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Because saying la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and establishing salah is you, you can do this. You have this belief, alhamdulillah, you establish your prayer. But maybe yourself, you still love dunya. You still love the dunya. For this reason, there is a charity. And this charity that you have to give will break your connection. Save, save, save money, money. No. This is a subhanAllah, an amazing command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That it break you somewhat, this, 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 uh, disattach you from this worldly life. So you give the charity. And when you give it, you feel good because you're giving back to your own people as well. You lift the threshold of, of poverty. It's no longer there anymore. People aren't begging in the street anymore. So the Prophet ﷺ continues in his advice. And as I mentioned to you, these advices are golden, a methodology that we follow. The Prophet ﷺ also advises Mu'adh ibn Jabal. He says, يَسِّرُوا وَلَا تُعَسِّرُوا بَشِّرُوا وَلَا تُنَفِّرُوا مُتَطَاوَعَا وَلَا تَخْتَلِفَا Subhanallah. So the Prophet Sallallahu says to both Mu'adh ibn Jabal and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhuma, make things easy. Okay, make things easy and don't make it difficult. Don't make it difficult. Give glad tidings to the people and don't run them away, repel them. And cooperate, cooperate with one another. You Mu'adh, you Abu Musa radiallahu anhuma, work together and do not become divided. These are pieces of guidance for us all. Nobody owns the religion of Allah Taala. Nobody owns the da'wah. No. We are all servants. We are all workers in the service of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, serving Allah's deen. This conference and down the road there's another conference. And there's another organization. And then down the road there's another organization. The Prophet ﷺ gave the advice to both Mu'adh and Abu Musa عنهما, work with one another, cooperate with one another, and do not differ. And this is a very, very well-known principle in the Qur'an. Do not divide yourselves, do not argue and separate. Because you will fail and your strength will disappear. Wasbiru, be patient. Inna Allah ma'asabirin. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with those who are patient. There may be difficult times. So Mu'adh radiallahu anhu and Abu Musa radiallahu anhu, they, would go, they went to Al-Yemen. They went to the different areas, calling people to la ilaha illallah. And also, subhanallah, the Prophet sallam reminded them and told them that you are going to people, the people of Yemen, raqiq al-qalb. They are soft-hearted people. These people in Yemen, they're soft-hearted. So, be soft with them. Don't be harsh with them. And I've just started speaking about this particular conversation between Mu'adh radiallahu anhu and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And the benefits are just like so many. But the insight and the knowledge of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa into the situation was so specific and so measured and so correct in how we should teach Call to the path of your Lord with wisdom using the kitab and sunnah and also with a fine word, a fine admonition. When you speak to them, don't shout and scream at them. You speak to them nicely. A person may be shouting in your face in London 
you know London is of course in the UK, there's a, there's a park. And there's a, this particular park called Hyde Park Corner. You may have heard of it. At this particular place, it's famous that all people with different ideas and beliefs, they go there and they, they used to be, back in the day, they used to pick a little box and you stand on the box and you just start talking to everybody. It's a very well-known every Sunday. And sometimes, alhamdulillah, a lot of Muslims, they go there to refute many of the misconceptions that people have concerning Islam. Islam is this, Islam is that. And they go there to defend Islam. And sometimes, subhanAllah, you find people, they are right there in your face shouting. But yet the brother is standing there, so calm. So calm, says, but please excuse me, can you stand back? If you need to talk to me, talk to me, don't shout at me. Some of them have taken on the adab, the manners of Islam and how to deal with people. There are some maybe who behave not in the correct way. The person came and started shouting in their ear. You raise your hand and, you put, and then a fight breaks out and then it's an awful look. It looks terrible. So the, the Prophet wasallam said to Mu'adh, you're going to people who have soft hearts. Be easy. And we should be like this with one another. Don't overburden people. Now, of course, we realize that, as I mentioned earlier, that that seed of iman takes time to build up. It takes time to strengthen. And at times with the excitement, because the person who embraces Islam on the first day and the second day, they feel so happy. They want to do everything. They want to do everything. When do I fast? Fasting? Bismillah. When do I fast? Well, you know, we can fast three days in the month. Three days? I can do more than this. Only three days? I can do more. Okay, well, then we can fast Mondays and Thursdays. Two days a week? No, I can do more than that. The iman is, is speaking. They, they are speaking that they can do more and more and more. They may not realize that this is not something sustainable for them. They could do it for maybe one week, maybe two weeks, and then, oh, it's too much. It's difficult for them. So, yeah, but I can do more than that. Well, okay. We have the fast of Dawood, alayhi salam. What's that? Well, you can fast one day, break one fast. Fast one, so every other day, that's the best. I'm doing that. And so they do that for one week and two weeks. And they're like, oh, it's too much. I can't do this anymore. And they feel, oh, Islam is a, little, is a bit difficult, you know. I didn't think Islam was like this. But they overburden themselves. This is why you educate the new Muslim. You educate them in that. Take things slowly. Yassiru. Wala tu'assiru. Make things easy for them. Not to the extent where we're compromising. No, don't worry about that. Okay, so you make things easy for them in that. The Prophet said, you know, make things easy. They believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The prayer. Don't worry about the prayer, brother. Don't worry. Just, just no. That's the first thing after the kalima they need to learn. Well, you know, with regards to, I don't know Arabic. That's okay. So you will learn it, inshallah. But Arab, I don't even know the letters. It's okay, you will learn. These are small phrases that you can say within the prayer. So there are things which you allow them not to overburden themselves. And they are, because they are so happy that they will want to at times overburden themselves and they don't realize. So the example that the Prophet Islam gave to Mu'adh ibn Jabal is a beautiful one. He also said to the, the companion Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, وَاتَّقُوا دَعْوَةَ الْمَذْلُومِ And be careful, O oh Mu'adh, be careful of the dua of the one who's been wronged, who's been oppressed. Don't wrong people. Don't let people feel that they have been treated or mistreated. فَإِنَّ لَيْسَ بَيْنَ اللَّهِ وَبَيْنَ دُعَاهِمْ حِجَابٍ That there is no, there is no barrier between their supplication and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answering their dua. There is no shield protecting even if they were a non-Muslim. If they were wronged and they called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah jalla wa ala will give them their right. So Mu'adh radiallahu anhu was given great advices, great advices how to deal with the new Muslim. 
How long do I have left? Sorry, brothers. How long I have left? Seven minutes. Okay, that was good timing. So we have seven minutes. So let me mention a couple of things, important things, concerning the incident of Mu'adh radiallahu anhu and the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Now, as you can understand, I've, there's a big focus on this incident with regards to this talk I'm talking about, I'm giving to you. There's a big emphasis on this particular incident. And there's a number of different ahadith that are brought together to give us a clear picture of exa exactly what, what happened. That also the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Mu'adh, إِيَّاكَ وَالتَّنَعُمْ Beware of luxury. Beware of luxury. فَإِنَّ عِبَادُ اللَّهِ لَيْسُوا بِالْمُتَنَعِمِينَ That the believers are not people who live always in luxury and you see their people in the opposite way. You show balance. You show balance. Be aware that what you're going to are people who are new Muslims. New Muslims. If they see you like this, they will question. So the Prophet ﷺ gave the most beautiful forms of advice to what was an enormous responsibility on the shoulder of Mu'adh radiallahu anhu and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. And because they adhered to, they adhered to this guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed their da'wah. Blessed their da'wah and Islam spread. Last thing I want to mention. I hope it's the last one. Maybe I'll think of something or I can fit it in. Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu. Amr ibn al-As. He was an individual who was a big enemy of Islam. If you remember that some of the Muslims, they made hijrah to Habasha and they went to a Najashi. You probably know this in the story, right? And there was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and Uthman ibn Affan and other companions radiallahu anhu. And so the Quraysh were unhappy that the Muslims escaped to Habasha. So they sent a couple of people. One of those people was Amr ibn Mas. And he was going to speak on, at that time, he wasn't Muslim, on behalf of the Quraysh to send the Muslims back because they're troublemakers. And in fact, Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, if you read his, the story of his life, it's just unbelievable how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses servants uses one person to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. So he says on his deathbed, Amr ibn al-As, radiallahu anhu, he said, when I was dying, he was dying on his bed. And his son, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, radiallahu anhu, he says, Ya Abati, oh my father, did not the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa give you glad tidings? He became Muslim maybe three years, just over three years, before the Prophet ﷺ passed away, oh, in the last three years that he was a Muslim in the life of Rasulullah ﷺ. But he went on to great things. He says, he's on his deathbed, he knows he's going to die. Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu. I received glad tidings from the Messenger of Allah. Ya Bunay, oh my son, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. My life. I can, three, three, three stages. I can put my life into three different stages. The first stage is that I was at a time in my life where the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was the most hated individual to me in my life. I want to do anything to harm him. If I died like that, I would be in Jahannam. I would have been in Jahannam if I died in that state. The second stage of my life. He says that Islam entered into my heart after the Muslims they came to in the conquest of Mecca. Allah Azza wa Jal softened my heart. And I came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was meeting people left and right. He said it was my turn. It was my turn to come to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to declare my Islam. So he said I put my hand out. And the messenger saw him put his hand out. And then he said, I, he said, I took my hand back. I was thinking, 
And so the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Amr, what's the matter with you? He says, Ya Rasulullah, ashtarit. I have a condition. I want to place down a condition. Before I enter Islam, I have a condition. So the Prophet ﷺ says, SubhanAllah, what's your condition? What do you want to say? Now the Muslims were in charge of Mecca, full power. Nobody could do anything to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And here is somebody who fought against Islam for so long. He wants to start making conditions, bargaining. The Prophet says, Ishtarat, make your condition. What do you want? He says, I want to know if I enter into Islam, I become Muslim, all my sins, Allah forgives them. Allah forgives all my sins. So the Prophet smiles. He says, Ya Amr, do you not know that Allah forgives everything that came before? You becoming a, becoming a Muslim, يُجُبُّ مَا قَبْلُهُ It wipes everything out. So he put his hand and he became Muslim. And he became one of the great leaders, one of the great generals in Al-Islam and went into the land, eventually into Egypt. Became the general of the Muslims to open the lands of Misr. But he said, that was my second stage. He said, if I died at that moment, because I was so happy, I felt I was flying. If I died at that moment, I would have great hope that I would be from the people of Jannah. He said, the third stage of my life, he said, is the time after that. Life, family, working, ibadah, da'wah, ups and downs. Who knows if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted from me or not? He said, this was the third stage of my life. Living Islam. Alhamdulillah, Allah Azawajal guided us to Islam. But we don't have guarantees. We don't have promises. You need to work. You need to work. Jannah is not balash, free. You need to work for it. You need to sacrifice. He said, this is the third stage of my life. And I don't know my state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You give me good reminders. It's a good thing to do. A person who is maybe close to the end, we give them good encouragement. Allah's mercy, you've done so much good. It's a good thing to do. But the person who's in that situation will have maybe a perspective. Nothing guaranteed. They have great hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no doubt. And for us, we have different stages as well as in our lives. We all have different stages. But subhanAllah, how Allah Jalla wa'ala uses individuals to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to utilize and use us in the very best way to serve his deen, Allahumma ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us true understanding of what it means to say, la ilaha illallah, ameen. And that we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to allow us to remain firm, steadfast upon this deen. Ameen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of you, my dear brothers and sisters. I ask Allah Jalla wa ala that he allows us to serve his deen continually. And that inshallah ta'ala tomorrow we have another lecture. And that we are able to share with benefit with one another. Barakallahu feekum. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.